Hello everyone, and welcome back to the Endgame class. As always, my name is Philip Denby, and tonight I wanted to take you through some really interesting endgames involving bishops against knights. And the, the inspiration for this was actually a game played in the Chinese Championship. So we just finished going over a few games in that championship uh, in the Road to 2000. And I wanted to give my guy, Xu Zhangyu, a chance at redemption here. Uh, as I said in the previous lecture, he's had a rather up and down tournament. We took a look at two really impressive games where his opponents just sort of played very good chess and managed to beat him. And now we're going to take a look at an end game where he actually managed to, to come out on top. And we're going to talk about some really important principles we can take from this end game about uh, the, the bishop and about knights in, in end games uh, and how they work against each other. So let's jump into it. Uh, playing white is Lin Yi, uh, another Chinese player who I was actually rather unfamiliar with, but in the Chinese championship. Uh, so, very, very strong. Uh, and just a quick note on Chinese players in general, it can be really, really difficult to gauge their actual strength internationally because uh, a lot of them, uh, the way I think the, the Chinese Federation sort of works right now is there are a lot of internal uh, events for Chinese uh, players to, to play in within, within the nation. But then to get to that point where you're traveling internationally, due to things like, you know, being located so far away from places like Europe where many chess events happen. Uh, players have to be very, very good before they can really get an established FIDE rating that truly represents how strong they are at chess. So just a word of warning, if you Google some of these players uh, and you're surprised at, at their ratings because it can be quite misleading. But anyways, uh, Lin Yi against Xu Zhang Yu. Let's take a look here. So we're not quite in the end game yet, but I want to just show you the, the lead up here. Uh, because uh, Zhu Zhangyu makes a pretty interesting decision with the black pieces rather than capture on d5 and go in for what is likely just a drawn ending. We actually see bishop a6 here, so a willingness to give up the bishop for the knight in this position. And we'll see if we can sort of discover why in a little bit. Uh, but okay, the game continues with b4. We don't really care about this. Not exactly an end game just yet. Some pieces get traded still. And now we see knight c4, uh, and this is our first key move that I want to talk about. So knight c4 played in the game, but let's pause here a little bit and see if we can discover what is going on in this endgame. Should anyone be better? Uh, I think most of us can agree that objectively, this game should likely end in a draw. From, from this starting position, the game should likely end in a draw. Difficult to argue with that, but if anybody's going to win, uh, who, it, who is it going to be and why? And you know, the who is it going to be? The answer might be easy because we know who won, but why? Why is black somehow practically potentially on the better side of things in this position? Let's see if you guys can give me a good reason. Knight takes d1 was correct. I tend to disagree on account of a knight on e2 hanging. I tend to disagree. Black because his pieces are better connected and more centralized. So that, that is a fair observation to make. Uh, this knight on e5 is sort of more centralized than any other piece. And you can argue that the knight is working with the bishop, uh, although this knight perhaps is not really influencing these two pieces at all. So that's a fair point. But the um, how do you prove an advantage then using these, these active pieces? We see the move knight c4, but like why play knight c4? What, what is the point? What is our goal in this position? What is our goal? We have some activity, but what do we want to do with that activity? So attack the pawns, and yes, attack the pawns is correct in this case, but it's important to understand why. We aren't attacking the pawns for the sake of attacking the pawns. We're attacking the pawns to force them to advance. Space can be a very double-edged thing in the game of chess. The more space that you have, the more difficult it can be to control all of that space. And with uh, the knights in particular, the knights sort of want 
the pawns to be drawn towards them in some cases to, to make them easier to attack and more difficult to defend. So black's goal in creating some practical chances here is to actually force these pawns up the board a little bit. And that's why we see the move knight c4. And after a4, I, I bet you can guess black's next move here. Chat room, black's next move. Of course, it's going to be the move knight b2. We want to put pressure on these pawns and induce them to move forward. So knight b2 actually creates a threat of capturing this guy and capturing this guy. So we see bishop c2 by white. And now black to move here. Black to move, how do we try and prove some advantage? What to do? What to do? How can we force these pawns to weaken themselves further? <clears throat> and yeah, uh, Pippinchuk has has the right idea. We we want to induce these pawns further uh, further up the board, so we need to attack them again. And we can do so with an idea like knight d5. In this case, though, uh, we don't really want to allow this trade because now we aren't making any progress at all, right? And perhaps it is white who is attacking our pawns. But bishop takes e2, giving up the bishop for the knight, is the move that you might expect given the topic of the lecture. But uh, I think this would be a move that is rather difficult for many people to play uh, in an over-the-board game. I think a lot of people tend to value bishops uh, very, very highly, especially in end games where there's pawns on both sides of the board. But in this case, the bishop on a6 is just simply worth less than the knight on c3, and so we see bishop takes e2, and this is where black starts to take uh, an objective advantage, not just a practical advantage anymore. By inducing these pawns so far up the board, uh, black is, is objectively a little bit better, perhaps, some, some pressure in the position that white is going to have to look out for. Now, is it enough to win? Probably not, but we'll see. It is going to be a difficult position for white from here on out. So, really cool move here. Bishop takes e2. Like, I, I feel like we're understating this, this idea here. This bishop on a6, pawns on both sides of the board, black's pawns are on dark squares, and black is so, so happy to give up this bishop for this knight. Really? Really difficult move, I think, for, for a lot of people to make. In a lecture, a bit easier, and in a real game, I think you'd be hard-pressed to find somebody whose first instinct here is to play bishop takes e2. But that's what uh, Zhu Zhongyu does, and, and it is correct. And the reason why will become a little bit more apparent after the move knight d5, right? We play knight d5, and all of a sudden, how do you defend your b-pawn? And the answer is, of course, you do not. And so, we get the move b5. And now, we have induced the pawns to be on uh, to be fixed on a color that is the same square as the bishop, and of course this should be the knight's goal in any position where uh, where there is a bishop left on the board. And of course the bishop's goal should be to put the pawns on the opposite colors so that they can attack the enemy pawns and don't have to passively defend their own pawns. So b5 by white, and black is now uh, a, a bit better. Uh, the game continues with knight b4, harassing this bishop a little bit further, notably almost short on squares, with both of these being covered. Uh, so bishop b3, the only move to keep defending this pawn. And now how do we continue? Well, of course, we simply go after this a pawn now. Knight 4 to d3, played in the game, knight d4, and now knight c5. And yeah, uh, black is potentially winning a pawn here. Uh, because black has been able to pull these pawns so far up the board and, and weaken them, uh, put them on the same color uh, as the bishop. So we continue with bishop to c2, and black does capture this pawn on a4, but we see that white's idea was not simply to just lose a pawn, because knight c6 is in fact a good response here for white. But what is the difference between you know, losing this pawn on a4 and losing this pawn on a7? 
And the answer, of course, is that this knight is a lot less comfy on the a7 square than this knight is on a4. That, that's why it can sometimes be useful to draw the, the opponent's pawns forward rather than, for example, way back in our initial position, uh, way, way back here even, trying to, to get some type of structure with the pawn on a5 instead. Like, for example, let's say we did this and played a5. Okay, let's, let's say we, we do all these trades, take here, take here, and, and play a5, right? By playing a5, we actually are giving ourselves a bigger weakness than our opponent in, in this case, right? So in this case, the, the main thing I want to show you guys is this idea of drawing the pawns up the board so they can be more easily attacked. Not something you see every, every game, but something that is useful to keep in mind. Okay, so knight c6, we just see king f8 by black getting the king in the game. Uh, f3 by white is just allowing white's king easier access to the center. And now black is happy to bring the king in with king e8 as well. Uh, white decides it's time to capture this pawn on a7. And now we see king d7, king f2, and now knight c3. Just uh, a really useful move to put pressure on this pawn and keep this knight sort of locked in on a7. Uh, we see king e3 now, activating the king. Knight d5 check, bringing the knight back a little bit. And after king to d4, knight e7. And black's idea now is that this knight on a7 is completely entombed. And I'm going through this endgame a little bit quickly here, but that's because the, the ideas are actually reasonably simple. They're, they're just sort of difficult to, to enact in, in your own games. So Xu Zhangyu does a really, really great job of keeping all these ideas in mind and executing them perfectly. So idea number one was draw the pawns forward. Idea number two, uh, white's pawn, uh, or black's pawn on a7 is a bit more difficult to capture than the pawn on a4 because it's so deep in black's camp that black is able to play against this knight and in a sense trap it on the a7 square. Notably, something like knight to c6 here would actually not quite be, be good enough to get this knight all the way back in the game. For example, knight back to c3, if you try knight d4, now knight e6, and this knight is going to have to move, and black is going to win this pawn. Or, for example, if white tries to take and defend, now our king is simply too close, and black again will win a pawn. Uh, okay, that's why white leaves the knight on a7, tries to activate the king, but this allows this idea of knight d5 to e7, and this knight is just stuck in a box forever. White tries to escape with bishop e4, defending this square. But we just trade our knight for the bishop now and build a barrier in front of the white king. And now there's simply no way to, to save this game. Uh, the winning plan is very simple. We go king c7, we go king b7, we go king takes a7, and the game is, is just over. White tries e5, but it's far too little too late now. King c7, h4, king b7. Take, take, knight c6, knight takes c6. And rather than b takes c6 and lose the king and pawn endgame, uh, white tried to go after the remaining pawns, but of course this is not going to be, not going to be good enough here. And after a few more moves, uh, white resigns. Why, why does white resign? Well, because black is going to easily bring the king back to stop these pawns, and the knight is enough to hold the pawn because it's defending it from behind. For example, King to d7, g5, uh, h takes g5, let's say h5, or h takes g. Either way, the king is in the box. King here, and you just can never, you can never take either of these pieces. So, so sad. So, so sad. Uh, and, and yeah, that's, that's the first game I want to show you guys. Really cool stuff here. Inducing pawns forward, and then playing against this knight on a7, and that was enough to win here because the bishop was you know, passively placed with pawns stuck on its own color. Let's move on to a more direct example of bishop versus knight now. We've seen a, a pretty cool example, I think, uh, from the Chinese championship where Zhu Zhangyu is so ready to play bishop takes a2. I think that has to be the move of the game. Giving up the bishop in the end game can sometimes be a good idea. Sometimes two knights are good. But Let's move on, like I said, to a slightly more traditional type of bishop versus knight endgame in an older game between Maya Chiberdanidze and Margareta Murasan. Did my best there on those names. Hopefully I did okay. 
Uh, and we're going to start from this position. I'm going to fast forward a bit as we trade off some pieces. Now we have uh, queen and bishop against queen and knight, but I want to simplify things a little bit further. So we, we see white keeping queens on the board until this move c5. And this is the one idea I want to talk about with the queen still on the board. This is a really, really good move by white here. The reason being, we have this bishop pressuring these pawns on the queen side, but this a7b6 structure is going to be difficult to break down had we, for example, just traded the queens immediately. Now you have to play like bishop e1, try to get b4 through, and it's going to be rather difficult. Whereas with queens on the board, we are able to easily play the move c5, break down the structure, and create a weakness on the queen side to attack. So useful idea here. Uh, using the extra material to make another weakness in the camp before going for the simplified endgame. Uh, okay, king f7 played in the game, now c5 is very much correct. We see b takes and queen takes, right? The queen served its purpose, we used it to create this extra weakness on a7 here, and now we are perfectly fine uh, trading off the queens. So queen takes on c5 played, bishop takes on c5. Now we see e5 by black, b4 by white is very, very natural, creating a threat. Uh, a6 is black's attempt to hold things on the queen side, ready to exchange things off here. Uh, and now I want to, to sort of pause and start, start our conversation here. Uh, up to this point, uh, black playing e5 is pretty natural, right? This pawn was backwards, we need a path for the king. And white playing e4, also very natural, trying to roll the majority. Black playing, is playing a6 essentially forced, otherwise b5 comes. But now, White has a decision, right? It's, it's a free move. You can do any number of things. And so let's pause here and try to come up with some kind of winning plan. Uh, what, what do you think we should do? What types of changes should we aim for in the structure? And, and how do we continue? How do we continue? Nico Dem says, you have heard that queens work better with knights than bishops, but you always thought it's like 50-50 which piece would be better. And yeah, this is sort of, uh, uh, it's, it's kind of funny. I think I actually remember um, some conversation between Peter Svidler and Jan Gustafsson. So by the way, guys, if you don't watch like Chess24's coverage of a lot of, a lot of these events, uh, I highly recommend checking out the, the coverage, especially with uh, Svidler and Jan because they just they spew chess knowledge 24-7. Uh, Svidler especially, he just can't stop. He just spews chess knowledge. He just, everything out of his mouth is like chess knowledge. Um, and they, they had a chat question that was, what is the, the worst principle that you've heard in chess that's just never true, or that you learned in chess that's just never true? And, and I think one of their answers was that queen and knight works better than queen and bishop, because it's, it's just not true, right? It's just not true. Sometimes it's true, but the, the bishop is usually just as good as, as the knight. So okay, everybody wants to start with b5, but this is not a winning plan. Maybe a5 and solidify the position. So if there's one move you don't want to play here, it's a5. I am willing to wager this is like the worst move on the board. Uh, that doesn't hang just material outright. Maybe f4 is worse, giving your opponent a protected pass pawn. But I, I would I would say a5 is probably worse. The reason for that is because uh, white has no problem uh, winning on the dark squares, right? That's where our bishop uh, reigns supreme. But we do have a problem winning on the light squares. So with a5, now it's going to be extremely, extremely difficult for white to ever be able to play the move b5 and create a pass pawn. Uh, so you guys were all saying the move b5, and I think b5 is, is perfectly fine. It, it's, it's a great move, makes a passed pawn. There, there's simply no rush for it, uh, though. And so b5 is, is sort of only half the plan. Only half the plan, right? And somebody said, you play b5, make a passed pawn, and then go after the pawns on dark squares on the king side. And that is a lot closer to the plan. But we have to understand that it's, it's not that simple to go after the pawns on dark squares on the king side, because things are very much still in flux on this side of the board, right? What's to stop black, given a few free moves, from doing this, 
right? And given a few more free moves from even doing this, right? And, and now how do we win? Like, how, how do you win now, right? All the pawns are on light squares. You can't really attack any of them. And it's, it's probably just a draw. Probably just a draw. So the question then becomes, how do you make sure that black is left with a weakness on the king's side? Uh, and so at its core, when you're playing with the bishop against the knight, there is one principle in chess that is usually true, and that is the principle of two weaknesses. And, and that principle is really at its best when you have a bishop against a knight. The reason for that is pretty intuitive. The bishop is a long-range piece. It can influence both sides of the board. The knight is a short-range piece and sort of has to, to pick one side of the board to, to play on. So when you have two weaknesses on different sides of the board, that's when you can really outplay the knight and, it turns out, win the game quite easily. So in the game, uh, Maya chose to start with the move of g4. And, and I like this move a lot because before the black king has time to really enter the game, you present, uh, you present black with a rather difficult question. And that question is, what do you do with this pawn on f5? There are a few options. You can play g6, you can play f takes g4, you could just play king e6, or you can play f4. Like all of these moves are, are pretty reasonable. So let's start with sort of the most intuitive. Why not f takes g4? And I think the reason why Maya started with g4, aside from a move like b5, which again is, is perfectly fine, is because now, after takes, our king does have a very direct route into the center, and we have a second weakness. We are, the second weakness is this pawn on e5. Now, with that being said, I think this is probably what black actually should have done. And the reason I think that is because this weakness is at, close, is at least pretty close to the queen's side, and as you can see, the knight is still defending it, right? The knight can still influence things that are happening on the e-file, whereas we'll see what happens in the game. Turns out to be a little bit more difficult for the knight to handle. So f takes g4 may be black's best try, but white's point now is that you have very easy access into the center of the board with the king, and this is going to be a weakness that does not go away. Uh, okay. Why not g6? So I think the idea behind, uh, behind white's play here is that if g6, we're going to be able to take on f5 and actually invade on the king's side with our king in many cases. And now our weakness that we're going after is actually going to be the h pawn. And while it's true that you can push this pawn forward to h5 in many cases, uh, it is going to be difficult to defend this pawn from uh, uh, a king invasion, perhaps, when our b pawn is going to be so threatening. So all in all, uh, Margareta's move of f4 may seem rather unintuitive, but uh, it's sort of, you know, n none of the options were good, right? And, and f4 is just one of the options that she chose. Now we do see white continue with b5. This sort of had to happen at some point. a b5, a b5, knight h4, or sorry, knight a5. And now uh, the, the moves of the game. Now the moves of the game here. White to play here. What to do? What to do? What to do? What's the plan here, chat? Pippin Chuck says, King F2, G, G. Uh, someone in the chat says G5. A couple people in the chat are saying H4. Someone says, bring the king to E4. Someone says, G5 looks rather strong. So I'm curious. Curious, curious about these ideas. So. King f2 is, in fact, much, much, much closer to a draw than a win for white, which could be unexpected, right? The b pawn looks pretty strong, but you really do need this second weakness on the king's side. And so what is black's response to king f2? Well, it's the move g6, right? You give black enough time, and black is going to be able to bring these pawns to light squares, and you're going to have a very, very, very difficult time uh, breaking through, if that is the case. 
For example, king e2, king e6, king d3, king d5, for example, bishop f8, but now h5. g takes, g takes, and how do you win the position? Not so clear. Not so clear, right? It's just not so easy. So king f2, not going to be the answer. And a lot of you were saying g5 looks super strong, hoping for h takes g5 and like invading somehow. And maybe, maybe this is true. Maybe like, you know, a pawn is a pawn here and black is able to hold on. But even the move h5 here, I think is, is probably quite good for black's holding chances, right? You just lock things down. On the king's side, you put this pawn onto g6, and you have the exact same drawing plan that we saw before. Captures, not forced in chess. However, the move h4 is, in fact, the correct move here. We need to go h4, h5, cementing this weakness on the king's side. And with this weakness, white is going to be able to win the game. So h4, h5, really, really important stuff here to be cementing these weaknesses. All right. Black plays the move g6, and of course, what should white do here? What should white do? So yeah, h4, g6 though, question mark. What to do? g6, threatening h5. Threatening h5. And yeah, of course, we should go h5 anyways. Now's not the time to bow out. We don't mind having a little bit of a weakness ourselves, because it's more important for us to have uh, our, our own weakness to attack here. Mm -mm. We do see the move, king f6. And seemingly, black is going to be able to get to our h5 pawn first. So what does this mean? What do we do? Are we going to lose our h5 pawn? Was this, was this h4, h5 plan wrong all along? What's to be done here? What's to be done? Bishop d6? Bishop d6, you might run into uh, knight b7. And you have to make a decision. Which diagonal do you want to be on? Bishop b6? OK. Play on the queen side, question mark. Now a counterattack on the queen side, so not quite, not quite. Not quite, not quite. Let me tell you a secret. What's better than the principle of two weaknesses? Perhaps it's the principle of three weaknesses, right? So uh, we, we're sort of calling this pawn for white a weakness for black, sort of, because black has to commit resources, in this case a knight, to stop the pawn. But black actually has two more weaknesses aside from that. We ensured that the h6 pawn is going to be weak, but also this e5 pawn is going to be weak. So, of course, the best way for white to play is to actually attack both of these weaknesses at once with the idea of bishop f8 to g7. Uh, and, and this is how white is able to get a winning advantage here. Uh, white does actually, though, insert the moves b6 and knight b7, which doesn't really change anything. Now bishop f8. King g5, and we're not as worried about our h5 pawn after the move bishop g7. When now black is unable to defend both of these pawns. Uh, black chose to take on h5, and now we see bishop takes on e5, and white is, is going to be winning now. Uh, why is white winning? Because black still has too many weaknesses to deal with, and we have now opened up paths for our king into the game. King g5 played, king f2. King, H, or King f5, bishop attacks the pawn, and once the pawn is induced forward, now we can bring our king over, give a check, bring our king up, and now, uh, sorry, after King h4, black actually went ahead and resigned here because there's no way to defend both of these pawns. Uh, and once one of these pawns falls, the, the next pawn will be following suit. For example, King f5, King here, you can try to pass, but uh, it's just not going to work out very well for you. For example, knight a5 or something. And, uh, okay, what's, what's the best way to actually like win this? Probably we put this guy here. And now your king is forced to defend this f-pawn, 
in the meantime, I will come do this and this and win the game. And that's the, that's the story of this endgame. So a few really key things to, to take away from this one, right? A few really key things. Uh, we started with queens on the board, which uh, I only wanted to spend a little bit of time here, because queens make things pretty drastically different uh, than, than the pure endgame. But the, the point I wanted to show is white uses this queen before trading queens off in order to play c5 and help advance the plan on the queen side, a, a plan that would not be possible had we traded on d6. So important stuff there. c5, weakening this diagonal, activating the bishop. Really, really good. We see bc5, queen c5, queen c5, bishop c5. And now uh, b4 and g4, I, I wanted to, to mention as, as a really great move. This is sort of great move number two by white. You attack the pawn on the light square, and you force your opponent to make an awkward decision before they are sort of in their ideal setup. Uh, black chose to play the move f4, and now b5 is rather obvious, but the really, really key point here is h4, h5, making sure black is left with weaknesses on dark squares that can be easily attacked. And, and that is how Maya goes on to win this game. h4, h5, and here the, the rest is history. Bishop f8 to g7. Black cannot defend both pawns. And then here, uh, black still cannot defend both pawns. As we see after king h4, with bishop g5 to follow, when one of the pawns falls, then we bring our bishop over to this square, attack f4, and bring our king in, and win the game. OK, so questions on this end game before we move on to, to a third. All right, Nico says, sometimes people say that you should keep your pawns on the color of your bishop or the opposite color. Either one, I think, is more nonsense than bishop and queen versus knight and queen. So there are, uh, the confusion arises because there are, are different rules for different points in the game. So uh, oftentimes in middle games, it's really, really useful to use your pawns to make up for a bishop that you lack and that your opponent has. So what that means is you use your pawns to guard the dark squares if you don't have a dark square bishop and your opponent does. Now that involves putting your pawns in dark squares in the middle game. However, when you transition to more of an end game, that sort of reverses. Now all of a sudden, if your pawns are all on dark squares, that bishop is able to attack them. Whereas earlier, with more pieces on the board, that wasn't exactly relevant because there were more important things going on with the pieces. But in an end game, then the bishop becomes more of an active attacking piece uh, against those pawns, and that's why you want them on the opposite color. N namely, when you are playing with the bishop, you want to have piece activity. You want to be active, not passive. And the way to do that is to be able to attack your opponent's pawns. And you can only do that if they're on the same color as your bishop. Can't ever attack a pawn that's out on the same color as your bishop. So that rule has a little bit more sense to it. It's just that it does change depending on what phase of the game you're in. And of course, the specifics can always get in the way. But good question. Good question. What was the, what was the best option for black against g4? So it's, it's tough to say. Uh, it, it is tough to say. I think perhaps this was a little bit of a better try. Uh, going king e6 here. But like honestly, th things are pretty tough already. Like white is still going to go h4, h5. But leaving yourself with a weakness on g7 might actually be a bit more manageable than a weakness on h6 because this king can can sort of jump back and forth between these squares a bit more easily. Honestly, though, this is just going to be a, a, a tough position for, for black to deal with. Like g6, I think you, you just run into the same exact problem as you had last time. Pawn being on f5 and sub f4 doesn't actually change all that much. And uh, yeah, f takes g is really the only other option, which maybe is a bit better, but I think black is going to have a, a tough time regardless. Black has a passer in this position. Well, it's, it's not a very useful passer, right? Not a very useful passer, because if we ever get too crazy and put our king here, all of a sudden bishop f8 lands on the board, and we're losing, losing pawns, right? Just, just losing pawns. Uh, so it's more of a weakness than, than, a, than a passer. Good questions, though. Let us move along to our next example here, which is going to be in a game between Vasily Smyslov and Bakuti Gurgenidze. 
Kudi Gurganidze, everybody's favorite player from, from chess history, of course. Um, okay, <laughs> let's take a look, though. Uh, we are a few moves out from the endgame I want to talk about with the bishop versus the knight. We have bishop takes e6 played on the board, and our rooks start to disappear. Rook e7 going after this pawn. Rook e1 tactically responding to the threat. Knight c5, bishop c4, and g5 played by black. Black getting perhaps a little bit of a head start on this idea of putting the pawns on the opposite color as the bishop. Useful to notice. And then we see some tactics that result in the rooks coming off the board. d2, rook d1, and these pawns disappear. Now h5 by black. We see a6 by white, taking the maximum amount of space here. g4 by black. Black is employing the strategy where when you are the worst side in an endgame, you want to try and trade as many pawns as possible in order to get closer to a purely drawn endgame where you can sacrifice something for the remaining pawn. Uh, and perhaps for this reason as well, in that previous example, uh, f takes g4 would have been better. But regardless, here we are. Now rook d6 is played. We see uh, takes on f3, king takes f3. We see a check, king e3, rook f6 takes and takes. So, chat room. White to move here. This should be a little bit more clear than the previous example. But white to move here. What do we do? What to do? White to move. G4 went too far. Maybe H4 was better. So yeah, we'll, we'll jump back and see if black could, could play better. But let's focus on winning this with white first. Let's focus on winning this. So yeah, you guys have, have the right idea. Uh, I, I might have led you the tiniest bit astray. Uh, by showing you this position. H4 is, is totally winning and is, of course, the right idea. But perhaps the, the nuanced best move is actually to play king d4 first, as played in the game. But h4 immediately. This is the right idea. It's winning here. It's absolutely correct. Great job, everybody. You have to cement this pawn on the light square if you want to win. Now, this might be a little bit in contrast to the previous position where I said a5 was like the worst move on the board. If you remember, I'm going to flip back really quick. Uh, a5, in this position, I said was the worst move ever. And it seems like you know, you're giving yourself the same type of backward pawn situation, uh, but it really couldn't be further from the truth here, because our bishop is on the opposite color, so we don't have much of an issue of controlling the g4 square. So h4, fantastic move, great idea. And the point is now, black just has an, an indefensible weakness and is going to lose the game shortly. Why do I say king d4 might be the new one slightly better move? Well, because it gains a tempo on the knight, and then we can do the, the exact same idea here of h4. What's the difference? Well, there's no king e5. That, that's the only difference. Uh, and of course, this doesn't matter too much because, uh, because, because white is still, still just winning, right? White, white's just winning here. But let's take a look at what happened in the game. In the game, white played king d4 first, which is great, knight d7. And then white played king d5. Then white played king d5. Just activating the king. Very, you know, simple stuff. Simple king forward, win game. But what should black play here? What should black play here? And yeah, Mikhail has the, the perfect idea here. Black plays the move h4. And uh, if you ask a computer, it'll tell you that white is like plus three, which is true. White is like plus three. The problem is plus three is not really plus a billion. And you need to be plus a billion in these end games in order to win, right? Plus three is not checkmate, OK? Plus three means you're able to win a piece somehow. So white might be able to win a piece somehow. But white may not be able to win the game, as we'll see uh, in a little bit here. So. Of course, of course, of course, white should have taken this opportunity to play the move h4. You play h4, you cement this pawn in h5, and you follow it up with bishop b2, 
You win the game. Game winner right there. Game winner. But hold on a second. Like, this looks like a pretty good position still for white, right? Like, this, this looks pretty good. This pawn's pretty weak. You know, we, have, we, have, we can make a passed pawn whenever we want on the king's side. Why isn't this winning for white? And now, and now, I shall flip the board. Don't, don't you hate it? Don't you hate flipping the board? Let's play it for black now. Okay, we found the move h4, and we are cruising. But there's still work to be done here. So let's come up with a drawing plan for black. How should we organize our forces with the black pieces in order to draw this game? Okay, everybody is saying knight b6 and trade, okay? I don't know if you are fully aware of how king and pawn endgames work, but in general, in king and pawn endgames, okay, well, first of all, it's, it's not our turn, so I should play another move. Bishop b2 is on the board. But, like, let's say white played h3. Like, this is probably losing, right? Yeah, this is just... So, not that. In the game that white plays bishop b2. So, sorry, I should have been giving you the position with, with it to be your move, so you know what your opponent did. You're going to sacrifice the knight for the a pawn and play h3. So the problem is, in chess, captures are not forced. Okay? Captures are not forced. And this is a, a big problem in chess. So you, you never are able to, to win the endgame after h3 because white is able to play g... or draw the endgame because white is able to play g3. So we need a better plan. We need a better plan. So let me let you in on a little bit of a secret here. Okay, a little bit of a secret. This is why we do all those super boring technical lectures on technical endgames with like no pieces on the board, okay? That's why we do those lectures, because they help you in positions like this. So let me ask you guys a question, okay? Let me ask you guys a question. All right, picture this. Picture this. We go king e7. White plays g4. We take it. They take it. We go knight f6 check. They go king c6. We go here. They go g4. What move are you going to play? What move are you going to play? Also, wait a second. Wait a second. <clears throat> okay, never mind, never mind. They waste a move, you go king here. Now they play g4. What move are you going to play? What move are you going to play? <laughs> Got the position slightly wrong. Yeah, you take the pawn and draw. This would have been more, more convincing had, had I not messed up the position. So of course you, you can't actually take the pawn here because bishop takes g4, locks your king out of the corner, and you actually do lose. But uh, this position... is actually a draw. Uh, you, you can't force the black king out of the corner when we have the, the pawn here on a7. Doesn't matter that the rook, that, that the pawn is of the, the correct color winning square. You just can't force this king out. You, you can't force him away. You can't do it. You just can't do it. You can try, but you just can't do it. You just can't do it. How do you get him out of there? How do you get him out? You can't, you can't do it. Gotta stalemate him. Gotta stalemate the king. So, that is the crux of Black's drawing idea here. The, the crux of Black's drawing idea is that if White does try to make this passed pawn on the king's side, we always have this kind of bailout option we are, where we are able to sacrifice the knight for the g-pawn and uh, can, can then draw the game. Now let me ask you a second question, okay? Knight f8 played in the game. What happens if White comes and takes the a-pawn? This is... Critical idea number two for black to be able to draw this game. What happens here?
Yet yeah, Chess King is still on this H3 idea to get the wrong pawn, but captures, they're not forced, okay? They're not forced. I don't know who told you that white had to take this pawn, but white doesn't have to take that pawn. And then you're gonna lose another pawn. And oh my god, then you're really losing. So now if we played in the game, what do we do if white comes and takes our A pawn? And yeah, the, the chat has the right idea here. Uh, you, you simply trap the king. And then he can never escape. And now what happens if g4 or g3? Well, we take it. And we go knight e6. And we blockade the pawn. And then we move back and forth forever. Right? The bishop can dominate the knight pretty well but it can't take away all of these squares, okay? You know, it's, it's a pretty good piece of dominating the knight, but even if you put it on d5, I still have a square I can pass on. And that's good enough for a draw. And white draws with a plus three position, according to the computer. Really powerful stuff. Uh, so, what does that leave white with? Well, that, that doesn't really leave white with a plan. We, we have uh, our way of, of stopping both ideas, so all that remains is making sure that we don't sort of let the white king go crazy and, and win this pawn for free somehow. So that's why you see the move knight f8, because black's king is actually pretty well placed. If white tries to go this way, we can follow suit. And if white tries to go this way, we can also follow suit. So king, D, king e4 played in the game, king g5 played by black, and king d5, king f6, bishop g4, black passes with the knight, bishop f3, we see a check, and black plays knight e6, keeping the king uh, still boxed out. Bishop e2, king back to g5, king e5, knight f4. And white continues to try. The second the white king heads to the d file, by the way, you see the black king appear on the f file. Uh, it would be a pretty huge mistake to play another knight move here and allow the king to capture. We need our king one file away so we can trap him on the a file. And now. Uh, they played on, and they played on, and they played on, and black did nothing, and then white played g3, but of course this is not enough to win the chess game, as we have discussed. And the last move of the game, black finally finds a way to sacrifice the knight for the g-pawn, and they agreed to a draw here. Of course, we have this basic draw that we discussed earlier with the king in the corner. And that's it, that's a drawn game. So all because white didn't play the move h4, uh, we see black able to draw this position. So really instructive stuff. Uh, okay, any questions on this end game? Questions on that h4 move? Questions on how black is actually able, able to draw in the end before we call it a night here and head over to Twitch? What if minor pieces could promote in chess? I'm not qualified to answer this question. So I will decline to answer. All in all, maybe a6 by white was a mistake. Uh, now you're, you're testing my, my knowledge of all this theory. Uh, yeah, I want to say maybe a, a6 was a mistake, but it, it doesn't actually matter. a6 is irrelevant, OK? a6 doesn't matter. Because, 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 black, white should have played h4 here and won the game. And when white played a6, rooks were on the board, and that's sort of a drastically different situation than when rooks are off the board. So I don't know if you can say a, a6 was, was a key mistake, because white had a winning position, right? So definitely I would say the mistake comes when white throws away the winning position. That would be my argument. Although I, do, I would say h4 here is a bit better. All right, well, I am going to head uh, going to go ahead and call it quits here, guys. Thank you so much for joining me for these two lectures here tonight. Uh, the fun is going to continue live on Twitch directly after this with Analyze Your Games. Uh, if you haven't had enough chess yet tonight, I would recommend heading over and checking it out. Uh, if you have, then I totally understand. Or if you're just watching the replay, uh, I want to say thank you very much for joining me here tonight. As always, my name is Caleb Denby, and I will see you next time.